As the Fort Collins police tell it, Tim Masters killed Peggy Hetrick in 1987. He was 15 years old. He lived within 100 yards of where her partially clad body was found with knife wounds. On his way to his school bus stop, he saw the body. He says he didn't know whether it was real. He thought it could be a mannequin, possibly a prank being pulled on him by neighborhood kids. There wasn't a trace of blood visible on her corpse, so he kept walking. He later admitted that he made a mistake, that he should have reported to police what he saw, but his mistake hooked police. He became their number one suspect. The day after they discovered the body, they pounded him with accusations during seven hours of interrogation while he told them that he had nothing to do with it. You put a shock. You shocked the hell out of everybody. You scared a lot of people. You scared me. I didn't sleep last night. I slept about two hours. You scared the hell out of me. Thank God we've got you here. Doesn't that make sense? Don't you feel a little bit more comfortable? We do. They were misleading him. They didn't have a shred of physical evidence linking him to the murder. The dozen mysterious fingerprints found in her purse weren't his. The two hairs found in her footwear, hairs that were possibly the killer's, weren't his. There were no violent markings on his body. There was no blood or other traces of Hetrick found at his home. No forensic evidence in his backpack or his school locker. What police found were his drawings and writings. They contained violent scenes, largely from the horror and war movies he watched with his Vietnam vet dad. Two teachers told police they were disturbed by his sketches, but the teacher who knew him the best and has a background in working with kids with special needs says many of the students in her classes drew violent images. Police never talked to her at length, she says. Well, I, I told her at the time, I said, I'm not a bit concerned about any drawings because every kid that I get from junior high, because they were the kids that some of them wore chains, some of them had spikes in their ears, you know, that kind of thing. And all of them at that time, we had Dungeons and Dragons, if you remember that that game. All of them drew horrific pictures as far as I was concerned, but not anything that was out of the ordinary. And Tim's weren't either. Eventually, police enlisted a California forensic psychologist to review Master's artwork. He concluded the drawings were reflections of a killer's mind without even meeting Master's. More than a decade later, Police used this analysis to help put him on trial for murder. He was sentenced to life. This is the story the Fort Collins police sold to a jury in 1999. But there was so much more the jurors and the public never knew. They didn't know that such analyses of artwork are considered questionably ethical in the psychology field. Well, direct contact is important so that you see the individual, you have direct contact with the individual, that you're not relying on, on other reports, on things that, that the person has written, uh, things that the person has drawn, but that you do a direct examination. They didn't hear in depth testimony about the exact nature of the wounds. A year before Master's trial, the medical examiner described them as surgical. In fact, the wounds were caused by a specific surgical procedure, according to Dr. Warren James, a veteran Fort Collins OBGYN 
who reviewed her autopsy photos. James says he himself, let alone a 15-year-old boy, would have difficulty making such precise cuttings. They didn't know that a prominent surgeon, who was a sexual predator, lived within 100 yards of where her body was found. Dr. Richard Hammond was never investigated for Hetrick's murder, and police destroyed evidence that could have shed light on whether he was involved. They didn't know that three Fort Collins police officers didn't believe Masters could be the killer. It just simply never sat right with me. And I expressed those views. Um, as, as many know, I was one that said Tim Masters could not have done it. And the question was always posed, well, what proof do you have that he didn't do it? And in my way of thinking, that's a little bit backwards. It's not what evidence did I have that he didn't do it that mattered to me. It's what evidence would we have that he did do it? What evidence do we have that I didn't do it? What evidence do we have that you didn't do it? That's not the way you go about investigating that type of a crime. The drive was to find facts to fit the hypothesis rather than to find the facts and then get a hypothesis from that. So over the years, this case has just, just eaten me up. I've had many a sleepless nights, many, many over the years, that has just haunted me to really feel that, uh, that we've had you know, two victims in this case and one that's, that's been sitting in a jail cell for many years in Buena Vista that's been totally innocent. Now, Master's hope is that DNA analysis will be able to show the truth once and for all, he says. But the two hairs found on Hedrick are missing. The photographs of the fingerprints from her purse are missing. And the prosecution, working with CBI, may have destroyed skin cell evidence on her clothing. Maybe that's the, maybe that's the, um, the legitimate criticism of, of me. Um, I, I, I can't go back that many years and know exactly where I was on knowing the status of, of DNA at the time. And um, if, if that was available, um, as you state, and I, I, don't, I don't doubt you, and that that was an investigative step that I could have taken and didn't, um, I, I accept responsibility for that. I don't even know how to describe it. It's a nightmare. Every day is a nightmare in here. To, to know that so many people out there accuse me of this, some people here think I did it, and I know I didn't do it, but here I am. Larimer County prosecutors have stressed that they have no statutory duty to preserve evidence. And they're right. Colorado law does not require preservation of DNA. Those with knowledge of the case say it's time for the truth to come out. He's innocent. He was never guilty. And I pray every single day that I am wrong because if I'm right, God help us that we've put an innocent person in prison for a crime that he didn't commit with no possibility of parole for the rest of his life. And even compounding that, we've allowed a killer to go unscathed. That's the concerns I have.